There are so many numbers and equations and formulas you're just expected to know when you're in the NICU. Hi, I'm Dr. Tala. I've been a neonatologist for over 15 years. We have already shot one video on general numbers and formula and stuff that you have to know for the NICU. And now we're going to go over kind of the rest of the stuff. We'll cover vitals and respiratory stuff and blood stuff too. Let's start with the vitals that you pretty much should know for the NICU population. And obviously we're talking temp, blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate. So let's start with temp. The most confusing thing about temperature in the US is that we use Celsius and Fahrenheit pretty much interchangeably. Like we'll even record them both on both babies and it gets super confusing. I'm not even going to go over the equation of how to convert one to the other because it's ridiculous. It involves subtracting 32 and multiplying by five nights and stuff. You're never going to have to do that. Just plug it into an app. It is confusing, but there are four temperature numbers you have to know. A fever is considered when a baby has more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more than 38 degrees Celsius. So remember, 138 and a baby is hypothermic, just as scary or maybe even scarier, if its temperature is less than 36.5 degrees Celsius or less than 97.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So remember those numbers, 36.5 to 38, 97.7 to 100. What about blood pressure for neonates? Well, the first thing you need to realize is that the smaller the baby and the younger the baby, the lower the blood pressure is. But the second thing you need to realize is nobody really knows what the ideal blood pressure is for the baby. It's a very confusing subject. We can't just say every preemie baby is hypertensive. So think about it logically though. Why do you have to have a good blood pressure? You need a good blood pressure so that the heart is pumping enough blood and oxygen around the body so that all the cells in the body are receiving the oxygen and the nutrition that they need. If the blood pressure is low, then it means that the body probably isn't getting the nutrition and the oxygen it needs. So we can look at other signs that there are low blood pressure effects in a baby. So for example, if the perfusion goes down, if the cap refill goes up, the baby's really pale. If the baby starts peeing less, if the baby stops tolerating its feeds, then these are all signs that could be considered a low blood pressure. The reason I brought all that up is in a way, all those signs are, import are just as important as the actual numbers of the blood pressure. So remember, a blood pressure normally is the systolic, the high one, the diastolic, and then the mean. So the mean blood pressure is the average of the systolic and the diastolic. Generally, the body spends longer in the diastolic, so the mean blood pressure is closer to the diastolic number. And as a very vague rule, if you need to learn anything about blood pressures, consider that the gestational age should be about the mean blood pressure. So for example, if you have a 30 weaker, then you want your mean blood pressure to be at least 30. This is a reasonable starting point, but honestly, if you've got a 30 weaker who's not peeing and is has really kind of thready pulses and their mean blood pressure is 30, then that is hypertensive for that baby. So in summary, look at the numbers, but also look at the baby when you're thinking about the blood pressure. What is a wide pulse pressure? And this is something that we see pretty often in babies, for example, with a PDA or even in kind of early sepsis. And this is much easier to actually define. So a wide pulse pressure or a pulse pressure is considered to be wide if you double the diastolic and it, that number is still less than the systolic. So for example, somebody tells you that some baby's blood pressure is 60 systolic, 20 diastolic. Is that wide? I know you're all kind of thinking it feels wide. So let's actually do the maths. So the diastolic is 20, multiply it by two is 40, 40 is still a lot less than 60, so yes, 60 over 20 is a wide pulse pressure. A normal respiratory rate for a newborn is somewhere between 40 to 60 breaths a minute. Immediately after a baby is born, they may be breathing a lot faster than this as they're trying to get the fluid out of their lungs. And a newborn's heart rate is somewhere between 100 to 180 beats per minute. The younger, the smaller the baby is, generally the faster the heart rate is. Older babies, especially if they're fast asleep, can have low resting heart rates in the 80s or 90s. 
What's a lot more important about the heart rate and really all of the vitals is where the vitals of that patient have been. So make sure that you get the baseline vitals on your patient so that you know if they go up or down, there's been a difference. What about the ideal oxygen saturation for a baby or kind of the fifth vital sign? So if a baby is on room air, then Obviously, we want the baby sats to kind of be in the 90s. It's okay if the baby goes up to 100%. But if we're actively giving the baby oxygen, we do not want the baby sats to be 100%. And the reason is, is we know that when we give babies really high oxygen exogenously and their saturations are like constantly 99, 100%, those babies have a higher risk of getting ROP, so bad retinal eye disease, as well as worse BPD, so worse chronic lung disease. So we don't want babies to have a really high saturation. Ideally, we probably want a growing baby's saturations to be in the low 90s. So generally, our alarm limits are somewhere between 88 and 95%. Like everything in medicine, there are so many exceptions. If you have a baby with bad pulmonary hypertension, you probably want the SATs higher than 88%. And while we're talking about saturations, how do we define an apnea? An apnea is when a baby stops breathing for 20 seconds or it's less than 20 seconds if that apneic event is associated with a color change, a desaturation, or bradycardia. So that is what would be considered an actual apneic event. I'm gonna say something very basic now, just to make 100% sure that everybody knows this. The amount of oxygen that we breathe in room air is 21%. So if a baby is on a breathing machine or on a nasal cannula on CPAP, the lowest amount of oxygen that you're ever going to give that baby, and none of the machines can actually really give lower than this, well, is 21%. The maximum oxygen that a baby can be on is 100%. So if a baby is already on 100% FiO2 and the baby's sats are in the 60s, you can't go up any higher on the FiO2. I know you know this. I'm just making 100% sure that every single person watching this knows it. Now let's talk about some delivery room numbers. When you are in the delivery room and you're setting up the FiO2 for a delivery, then right now the NRP recommends that for a term baby, you set up the FiO2 at 21%. So if a full term baby is coming out, you're just giving that baby room air. And if it's a preemie baby, then set up the FiO2 somewhere between 21 and 30%. And also according to NRP, two more numbers that you need to know. At what point do you actually give positive pressure ventilation? Well, if the heart rate is less than 100, then at that point you should start giving the baby breaths, positive pressure ventilation, or obviously if the baby's not breathing. And when you start chest compressions, well, you start chest compressions after the positive pressure ventilation is clearly not working, and hopefully you've already got an endotracheal tube in, and the heart rate is staying below 60. So if the heart rate is below 60, despite good PPV, then you should start chest compressions. So remember those two numbers, 160. What about if you are in the delivery room and you actually have to intubate the baby? What size tube should you use? How far should you push it in? What blade should you use? Let's start with the actual ET tubes, the endotracheal tubes. In the NICU, we are using endotracheal tubes between 2.0 and 4.0. But honestly, the vast majority of them are between 2.5 and 3.5. A good way to remember roughly what size ET tube a baby needs is one, two, three. When a baby is between one and two kilos, the baby needs a 3.0 ET tube. If the baby's above two kilos, then the baby pretty much needs a 3.5. If the baby's below one kilo, then the baby pretty much needs a 2.5. Then the tiny, tiny ones, maybe the 22, 23 weekers that you literally can't fit a 2.5 in, you'll use a 2.0. And the really big babies, the term babies that you don't want any leak, whether it's a bad CDH or it's a big surgical babies, then those are the ones that you'd use a 4.0 on. Another good mnemonic for this is at 25 weeks, use 2.5. At 30 weeks, use 3.0. 
At 35 weeks, use 3.5. I mean, they're both pretty similar, but honestly, the truth is you never really know the size of the baby's vocal cords unless you're actually going in to intubate. And what about the size of the actual blades, the laryngoscopes? So most of the time with NICU babies, we're using a size zero blade. For the really big babies, then you might need a size one. And for the little babies, kind of less than kind of 28 weeks, you'd use a double zero. For the really tiny ones, there's now a triple zero available. These are used very rarely. And then how far do you actually push in the endotracheal tube? Well, the formula that we've always used is the weight of the baby plus six centimeters. So for example, if you intubate a two kilo baby, then it should be two plus six. So you should push the endotracheal tube in eight centimeters. But as a quick aside, we've also figured out that the really small babies, the ones that are kind of considerably less than a kilo, generally need the tubes in somewhere between 5.5 and six centimeters. So that equation doesn't really work for the tiny little babies. Like a 22, 23 weeker, it pretty much has that endotracheal tube in somewhere between five and 5.5 centimeters. But whenever you do intubate a baby, you should be checking its position with a chest x-ray. And ideally, you want the end of the endotracheal tube to be between the clavicles and the carina. And the carina is where the trachea splits off into the bronchi. So kind of midway between that is a great position for the endotracheal tube. There are a couple more respiratory numbers that I want to go over. And the first one is the oxygen saturation in the delivery room realize that it takes several minutes for a baby to actually pink up. And at one minute of life, a baby's saturations are expected to be about 60%. So look at this table from NRP. We really don't expect the baby to have an oxygen saturation above 90% until they're about 10 minutes old. So we constantly have to remind ourselves of this so we don't get overly excited that the SATs at five minutes is still in the 80s and everybody wants to give oxygen and stuff. It takes time for a baby to pink up. The other respiratory equation that we use is something called the oxygenation index. So basically, this is a marker of how bad the lung disease or how poorly this baby is actually oxygenating. And the way that we calculate it is the mean airway pressure that the baby is on multiplied by the FiO2 divided by the PaO2. So divided by the oxygen that's dissolved in the baby's blood, not the oxygen saturation. So you can only get the PaO2 by actually doing an art stick and looking at the number on the blood gas result. So as an example, let's say you're on the oscillator and your mean is 20. On the oscillator, the mean is very obvious. It, the other machines will still calculate it, but it's kind of easiest on the oscillator. The mean is 20 and you're on an FiO2 of 100%. Honestly, the only times I ever calculate the OI is when the baby's on 100%. So the mean of 20 times 100, and let's say that the baby's PaO2 is 42. So 20 times 100 divided by 42 equals 47. That's a really high OI. Once your OI is above about 40, then if the baby's a candidate, you're thinking about ECMO. If the OI is above about 20 to 25, then you should be considering INO. Okay, if you've reached this far, then can you like this video and then tell us where in the world you're actually watching this from? We are filling in a map of the world from where every, where every NICU is. So we would love to be able to finish that map. Now let's move on to some hematological or blood numbers and equations that would be very helpful to know. These are all a, a little bit different from actual adult numbers. So I think it's very important that everybody kind of understands that. So the first thing is you should realize that a normal WBC count for a neonate is somewhere between five and 30,000. So kind of lower as well as higher than an older kid or an adult. And there are two numbers that we like to calculate or two equations that we like to use in the NICU. And those are the I over T ratio or the immature over total ratio, as well as the absolute neutrophil count. Before you calculate either of them, you have to know all the cells in the myelogenous lineage actually in the neutrophil lineage. And as you all know, the neutrophils are the type of the white blood cells that take up about 40 to 60% of all the white blood cells. And they're very active in fighting infections. The bone marrow makes immature neutrophils and then they slowly develop until the neutrophils are mature. In a healthy person, the bone marrow would wait 
until the neutrophils are mature before it spits them out into the blood circulation. But if a patient is ill and is desperate to get anything out there to fight infections, then sometimes the bone marrow will spit out some of those immature forms. If the bone marrow is really sick, then it's basically barely spitting out any WBCs, let alone any neutrophils. And this could be a really bad sign for a baby having an infection or neck or something. So one of the ways that we can calculate this is the absolute neutrophil count. So really, out of all the WBCs, you want to know how many of them are actually from the neutrophil lineage. So you look at your WBC count, and then you look at the percentages of all the neutrophil precursors, as well as the neutrophils, add them up, and then multiply them by the number of WBCs that you have. Obviously, you need to know all the precursors of the neutrophils to be able to count them out. So the precursors are a myeloblast, that's the earliest, promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, band, and then a segmented neutrophil. So let's say our total WBC count is 12.4 thousand, and we have 50% segmented neutrophils, or SEGs, 7% bands and 3% metamyelocytes and none of the others. Sometimes we only have bands, sometimes we only have sex and we don't have any immature cells. But in this case, we have 50 sex plus seven bands plus three metamyelocytes. So altogether, we have 60% of the blood cells from the neutrophil lineage. So the ANC here is 60% times 12.4 thousand, which is 7.44 thousand. We worry about sepsis or we worry about the baby's immune function when the ANC is less than 1,500. And if you want more details with this, then go back and look at the WEC lecture we made very early on in this channel. And what about the I over T ratio or the immature over total cells ratio? Again, this is all in the neutrophil lineage. So again, you have to realize which of those cells are immature. So let's do another example. Let's say you have 3% promylos, 3% metamylos, and 5% bands, and we have 15% segs. So let's add up the immature cells. That's 3 plus 3 plus 5 equals 11. And then you have to do the ratio of immature over total. So the, which is immature plus sex. So you do 11 divided by 11 plus 15. So this equals 11 divided by 26 equals 0.42. So here your I over T ratio is 0.42. A lot of people argue that any I over T ratio above about 0.2 to 0.3 can be considered concerning. The ID specialists remind us all the time that these numbers are neither sensitive nor specific. And the last thing that I want to say about blood is that a platelet count of less than 150,000 is considered thrombocytopenia. And in neonates, they kind of act differently to the rest of the population in that a lot of times when babies get stressed out, their platelets go down. Whereas in older kids and adults, if they get septic or stressed or something is going on with their bodies, their platelets can go up to react to that. So remember, less than 150,000 is thrombocytopenia. Okay, I think those are the equations and numbers and formulas we all use more of most often. If there's any that you think we've missed, please include them below. In the meantime, please like this video, subscribe if you're interested in neonatal education, and I just want to thank you again so much for being here. Thank you.